Chapter number twelve of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter twelve Claude Arion Helvetius. If France at the present day has not reason to be proud of its leading man, it has in former times produced those minds that shed lustre upon the country, and who, by their literature, add immortality to its renown. During the eighteenth century, when religious persecution and intolerance were rampant throughout Europe, France furnished men to check oppression and expose superstition, while others followed to lay the foundation of excellence and greatness in the examination and cultivation of its true source, the mind. Helvetius sought to direct men's attention to self-examination, and to show how many disputes might be avoided if each person understood what he was disputing about. Helvetius on the Mind is a work that ought to be read widely, and studied attentively, especially by rising young men, as it is one of those secular works too rarely found among our literature. Claude Arion Helvetius was born in Paris in the year 1715. After his preparatory studies, he was sent to the college of Louis le Grand, having for his tutor the famous Poré, who bestowed additional attention upon Helvetius, perceiving in him great talent and genius. Early in life, Helvetius formed the friendship of some of the leading minds of France. Montesquieu being his intimate friend, Voltaire, too, sought his correspondence when at the age of twenty-three, calling him his young Apollo and his son of Parnassus. The first literary attempts of Helvetius consisted of poetry, Epistles on Happiness, which appeared as a posthumous production with the lavish commendations of Voltaire. After ten years' thought and study, Helvetius, in 1758, published a work entitled De l'Esprit, which brought upon him a great amount of persecution. The Parliament of Paris condemned it, and Helvetius was removed from the office he held of Maître de Hôtel to the Queen. Voltaire remarks, it is a little extraordinary that they should have persecuted, disgraced, and harassed a much respected philosopher of our days, the innocent, the good Helvetius, for having said that if men had been without hands they could not have built houses or worked in tapestry. Apparently those who have condemned this proposition have a secret for cutting stones and wood, and for sewing with the feet. I have no doubt that they will soon condemn to the galleys the first who shall have the insolence to say that a man cannot think without his head, for some bachelor will tell him the soul is a pure spirit, the head is nothing but matter." God can place the soul in the nails as well as in the skull. Therefore I proscribe you as impious. During the persecution raised against him, Helvetius visited England in 1764. In 1765 he visited Prussia, being well received by Frederick, in whose place he lodged. Voltaire strongly advised Helvetius to leave France in these words, in your place i should not hesitate a moment to sell all that i have in france there are some excellent estates in my neighborhood and there you might cultivate in peace the arts you love about this period hume became acquainted with helvetius whom he styles in writing to dr robertson a very fine genius and worthy man in 1765 helvetius returned from prussia and retired to his estate at Bois. The sight of misery much affected him, and when relieving distress he enjoined strict secrecy. 
sometimes when told he relieved those undeserving his aid he would say if i were a king i would correct them but as i am only rich and they are poor i do my duty in relieving them an attack of gout in the head and stomach terminated his life in december seventeen seventy one in the fifty-sixth year of his age in de l'esprit or essays on the mind chapter one helvetius makes the following remarks on the mind considered in itself we hear each day disputes with regard to what ought to be called the mind each person delivers his thoughts but annexes different ideas to the word and thus the debate is continued without understanding each other in order therefore to enable us to give a just and precise idea of the word mind and its different acceptations it is necessary first to consider the mind in itself we consider the mind either as the effect of the faculty of thinking and in this sense the mind is no more than an assemblage of our thoughts or we consider it as the very faculty of thinking but in order to understand what is meant by the mind in the latter acceptation we ought previously to know the productive causes of our ideas man has two faculties or if i may be allowed the expression two passive powers whose existence is generally and distinctly acknowledged the one is the faculty of receiving the different impressions caused by external objects and is called physical sensibility the other is the faculty of preserving the impressions caused by those objects called memory and memory is nothing more than a continued but weakened sensation those faculties which i consider as the productive causes of our thoughts and which we have in common with beasts would produce but a very small number of ideas if they were not assisted by certain external organizations if nature instead of hands and flexible fingers had terminated our wrist with the foot of a horse mankind would doubtless have been totally destitute of art habitation and defence against other animals wholly employed in the care of procuring food and avoiding the beasts of prey they would have still continued wandering in the forests like fugitive flocks it is therefore evident that according to this supposition the police would never have been carried in any society to that degree of perfection to which it is now arrived there is not a nation now existing but with regard to the action of the mind must not have continued very inferior to certain savage nations who have not two hundred different ideas nor two hundred words to express those ideas and whose language must consequently be reduced like that of animals to five or six different sounds or cries if we take from it the words bow arrow nets etc which suppose the use of hands from whence i conclude that without a certain exterior organization sensibility and memory in us would prove two sterile faculties we ought to examine if these two faculties by the assistance of this organization have in reality produced all our thoughts but before we examine this subject i may possibly be asked whether these two faculties are modifications of a spiritual or a material substance this question which has formerly been so often debated by philosophers and by some persons revived in our time does not necessarily fall within the limits of my work what i have to offer with regard to the mind is equally conformable to either of these hypotheses 
I shall therefore only observe that if the church had not fixed our belief in respect to this particular, and we had been obliged by the light of reason alone to acquire a knowledge of the thinking principle, we must have granted that neither opinion is capable of demonstration and consequently that by weighing the reasons on both sides balancing the difficulties and determining in favor of the greater number of probabilities we should form only conditional judgments it would be the fate of this problem as it hath been of many others to be resolvable only by the assistance of the calculation of probabilities helvetius on the question whether genius ought to be considered as a natural gift or as an effect of education says i am going to examine in this discourse what the mind receives from nature and education for which purpose it is necessary first to determine what is here meant by the word nature this word may raise in our minds a confused idea of a being or a force that has endued us with all our senses now the senses are the sources of all our ideas being deprived of our senses we are deprived of all the ideas relative to them a man born blind has for this reason no idea of colors it is then evident that in this signification genius ought to be considered as a gift of nature but if the word be taken in a different acceptation and we supposed that among the men well formed and endued with all their senses without any perceivable defect of their organization nature has made such a remarkable difference and formed such an unequal distribution of the intellectual powers that one shall be so organized as to be stupid and the other be a man of genius the question will become more delicate i confess that at first we cannot consider the great inequality in the minds of men without admitting that there is the same difference between them as between bodies some of which are weak and delicate while others are strong and robust what can here occasion such variations from the uniform manner wherein nature operates this reasoning it is true is founded only on analogy it is like that of the astronomers who conclude that the moon is inhabited because it is composed of nearly the same matter as our earth how weak soever this reasoning may be it must yet appear demonstrative for say they to what cause can be attributed the great disproportion of intellects observable between people who appear to have had the same education in order to reply to this objection it is proper first to inquire whether several men can strictly speaking have the same education and for this purpose to fix the idea included in the word education if by education we merely understand that received in the same places and under the same masters in this sense the education is the same with an infinite number of men but if we give to this word a more true and extensive signification and in general comprehend everything that relates to our instruction then i say that nobody receives the same education because each individual has for his preceptors if i may be allowed to say so the form of government under which he lives his friends his mistresses the people about him whatever he reads and in short chance that is an infinite number of events with respect to which our ignorance will not permit us to perceive their causes and the chain that connects them together now this chance has a greater share in our education than is imagined it is this places certain objects before us and in consequence of this occasions more happy ideas and sometimes leads to the greatest discoveries to give some examples it was chance that conducted galileo into the gardens of florence when the gardeners were working the pumps 
it was that which inspired those gardeners when not being able to raise the water above the height of thirty-two feet to ask him the cause and by that question piqued the vanity of the philosopher put in action by so casual a question that obliged him to make this natural effect the subject of his thoughts till at last by discovering the weight of the air he found the solution of the problem in the moment when the peaceful soul of newton was employed by no business and agitated by no passion it was also chance that drawing him under an apple tree loosened some of the fruit from the branches and gave that philosopher the first idea of his system on gravitation it was really this incident that afterwards made him turn his thoughts to inquire whether the moon does not gravitate towards the earth with the same force as that which bodies fall on its surface it is then to chance that great geniuses are frequently obliged for their most happy thoughts how many great minds are confounded among the people of moderate capacities for want of a certain tranquillity of soul the question of a gardener or the fall of an apple of the exclusive qualities of the mind and soul helvetius observes my view in the preceding chapters was to affix clear ideas to the several qualities of the mind i propose in this to examine if there are talents that must necessarily exclude each other this question it is said is determined by facts no person is at the same time superior to all others in many different kinds of knowledge newton is not reckoned among the poets nor milton among the geometricians the verses of leibnitz are bad there is not a man who in a single art as poetry or painting has succeeded in all the branches of it corneille and racine have done nothing in comedy comparable to moliere michelangelo has not drawn the pictures of albany nor albany painted those of julius romano the genius of the greatest men appears then to be confined within very narrow limits this is doubtless true but i ask what is the cause is it time or is it wit which men want to render themselves illustrious in the different arts and sciences the progress of the human mind it is said ought to be the same in all the arts and sciences the operations of the mind are reduced to the knowledge of the resemblances and differences that subsist between various objects it is then by observation that we obtain in all the different kinds of study the new and general ideas on which our superiority depends every great physician every great chemist may then become a great geometrician a great astronomer a great politician and the first in short in all the sciences this fact being stated it will doubtless be concluded that it is the short duration of human life that forces superior minds to limit themselves to one kind of study it must however be confessed that there are talents and qualities possessed only by the exclusion of some others among mankind some are filled with the love of glory and are not susceptible of any other of the passions some may excel in natural philosophy civil law geometry and in short in all the sciences that consist in the comparison of ideas a fondness for any other study can only distract or precipitate them into errors there are other men susceptible not only of the love of glory but an infinite number of other passions these may become celebrated in different kinds of study where the success depends on being moved such is for instance the dramatic kind of writing but in order to paint the passions we must as i have already said feel them very warmly we are ignorant both of the language of the passions and of the sensations they excite in us 
when we have not experienced them thus ignorance of this kind always produces mediocrity if fontenelle had been obliged to paint the characters of rhodomistus brutus or cataline that great man would certainly have fallen much below mediocrity let a man for instance like m de fontenelle contemplate without severity the wickedness of mankind let him consider it let him rise up against crimes without hating the criminals and people will applaud his moderation and yet at the same instant they will accuse him of being too lukewarm in friendship they do not perceive that the same absence of the passions to which he owes the moderation they commend must necessarily render him less sensible of the charms of friendship the abuse of words by different schools of philosophers is thus ably pointed out descartes had before locke observed that the peripatetics entrenching themselves behind the obscurity of words were not unlike a blind man who in order to be a match for his clear-sighted antagonist should draw him into a dark cavern now added he if this man can introduce light into the cavern and compel the peripatetics to fix clear ideas to their words the victory is his own in imitation of descartes and locke i shall show that both in metaphysics and morality the abuse of words and the ignorance of their true import is a labyrinth in which the greatest geniuses have lost themselves and in order to set this particular in a clear light instance in some of those words which have given rise to the longest and sharpest disputes among philosophers such in metaphysics are matter space and infinite it has at all times been alternately asserted that matter felt or did not feel and given rise to disputes equally loud and vague it was very late before it came into the disputants heads to ask one another what they were disputing about and to annex a precise idea to the word matter had they at first fixed the meaning of it they would have perceived if i may use the expression that men were the creators of matter that matter was not a being that in nature there were only individuals to which the name of body had been given and that this word matter could import no more than the collection of properties common to all bodies the meaning of this word being determined all that remained was to know whether extent solidity and impenetrability were the only properties common to all bodies and whether the discovery of a power such for instance as attraction might not give rise to a conjecture that bodies had some properties hitherto unknown such as that of sensation which though evident only in the organized members of animals might yet be common to all individuals the question being reduced to this it would have appeared that if strictly speaking it is impossible to demonstrate that all bodies are absolutely insensible no man unless instructed by a particular revelation can decide the question otherwise than by calculating and comparing the verisimilitude of this opinion with that of the contrary instructed by the errors of great men who have gone before us we should be sensible that our observations however multiplied and concentrated are scarcely sufficient to form one of those partial systems comprehended in the general systems add that it is from the depth of imagination that the several systems of the universe have hitherto been drawn and as our informations of remote countries are always imperfect so the informations philosophers have of the system of the world are also defective with a great genius and a multitude of combinations the products of their labors will be only fictions till time and chance shall furnish them with a general fact to which all others may be referred what i have said of the word matter i say also of space 
most of the philosophers have made a being of it and the ignorance of the true sense of the word has occasioned long disputes they would have been greatly shortened by annexing a clear idea to this word for then the sages would have agreed that space considered in bodies is what we call extension that we owe the idea of a void which partly composes the idea of space to the interval seen betwixt two lofty mountains an interval which being filled only by air that is by a body which at a certain distance makes no sensible impression on us must have given us an idea of a vacuum being nothing more than a power of representing to ourselves mountains separated from each other and the intervening distances not being filled by other bodies with regard to the idea of infinite comprehended also within the idea of space i say that we owe this idea of infinite only to the power which a man standing on a plane has of continually extending its limits the boundary of his imagination not being determinable the absence of limits is therefore the only idea we can form of infinite had philosophers previously to their giving any opinion on this subject determined the signification of the word infinite i am inclined to believe they would have adopted the above definition and not spent their time in frivolous disputes to the false philosophy of former ages our gross ignorance of the true signification of words is principally owing as the art of abusing them made up the greatest part of that philosophy this art in which the whole science of the schools consisted confounded all ideas and the obscurity it threw on the expressions generally diffused itself over all the sciences especially morality the following remarks show helvetius's notions of the love of glory by the word strong passion i mean a passion the object of which is so necessary to our happiness that without the possession of it life would be insupportable this was omar's idea of the passion when he said whoever thou art that lovest liberty desirest to be wealthy without riches powerful without subjects a subject without a master dare to condemn death kings will then tremble before thee whilst thou alone shalt fear no person it was the passion of honour and philosophic fanaticism alone that could induce timisha the pythagorean in the midst of torture to bite off her tongue that she might not expose herself to reveal the secrets of her sect cato when a child going with his tutor to scylla's palace at seeing the bloody heads of the proscribed asked with impatience the name of the monster who had caused so many roman citizens to be murdered he was answered it was scylla how he says does scylla murder thus and is scylla still alive yes it was replied the very name of scylla disarms our citizens oh rome cried cato deplorable is thy fate since within the vast compass of thy walls not a man of virtue can be found and the arm of a feeble child is the only one that will oppose itself against tyranny then turning towards his governor give me said he your sword i will conceal it under my robe approach scylla and kill him cato lives and rome is again free if the generous pride the passion of patriotism and glory determines citizens to such heroic actions with what resolution and intrepidity do not the passions inspire those who aim at distinction in the arts and sciences and whom cicero calls the peaceable heroes it is from a desire of glory that the astronomer is seen on the icy summits of the cordilleras placing his instruments in the midst of snows and frost which conducts the botanist to the brinks of precipices in quest of plants 
which anciently carried the juvenile lovers of the sciences into egypt ethiopia and even into the indies for visiting the most celebrated philosophers and acquiring from their conversation the principles of their doctrine how strongly did this passion exert itself in demosthenes who for perfecting his pronunciation used every day to stand on the seashore and with his mouth full of pebbles harangue the agitated waves it was from the same desire of glory that the young pythagorean submitted to a silence of three years in order to habituate themselves to recollection and meditation it induced democritus to shun the distractions of the world and retire among the tombs to meditate on those valuable truths the discovery of which as it is always very difficult is also very little esteemed in fine it was this that prompted heraclitus to cede to his younger brother the throne of ephesus to which he had the right of primogenitor that he might give himself up entirely to philosophy which made the athletic improve his strength by denying himself the pleasures of love it was also from a desire of popular applause that certain ancient priests renounced the same pleasures and often as boynton pleasantly observes of them without any other recompense for their countenance than the perpetual temptation it occasions the cause says cardinal richelieu why a timorous mind perceives an impossibility in the most simple projects when to an elevated mind the most arduous seems easy is because before the latter the mountains sink and before the former molehills are metamorphosed into mountains the different motives that influence our conduct are thus stated a mother idolizes her son i love him she says for his own sake however one might reply you take no care of his education though you are in no doubt that a good one would contribute infinitely to his happiness why therefore do not you consult some men of sense about him and read some of the works written on this subject why because says she i think i know as much of this matter as those authors and their works but how did you get this confidence in your own understanding is it not the effect of your indifference an ardent desire always inspires us with a salutary distrust of ourselves if we have a suit at law of considerable consequence we visit counsellors and attorneys we consult a great number and examine their advice are we attacked by any of those lingering diseases which incessantly place around us the shades and horrors of death we seek physicians compare their opinions read physical books we ourselves become little physicians such is the conduct prompted by a warm interest with respect to the education of children if you are not influenced in the same manner it is because you do not love your son as well as yourself but adds the mother what then should be the motive of my tenderness among fathers and mothers i reply some are influenced by the desire of perpetuating their name in their children they properly love only their names others are fond of command and see in their children their slaves the animal leaves its young when their weakness no longer keeps them in dependence and paternal love becomes extinguished in almost all hearts when children have by their age or station attained to independence then said the poet sadi the father sees nothing in them but greedy airs and this is the cause adds some poet of the extraordinary love of the grandfather for his grandchildren he considers them as the enemies of his enemies there are in short fathers and mothers who make their children their playthings and their pastime the loss of this plaything would be insupportable to them but would their affliction prove that they loved the child for itself everybody knows this passage in the life of m de lauzon he was in the bastille 
there without books without employment a prey to lassitude and the horrors of a prison he took it in his head to tame a spider this was the only consolation he had left in his misfortune the governor of the bastille from an inhumanity common to men accustomed to see the unhappy crushed the spider the prisoner felt the most cutting grief and no mother could be affected by the death of a son with a more violent sorrow now whence is derived this conformity of sentiments for such different objects it is because in the loss of a child or in the loss of the spider people frequently weep for nothing but for the lassitude and want of employment into which they fall if mothers appear in general more afflicted at the death of a child than fathers employed in business or given up to the pursuit of ambition it is not because the mother loves her child more tenderly but because she suffers a loss more difficult to be supplied the errors in my opinion are in this respect very frequent people rarely cherish a child for its own sake that paternal love of which so many men make a parade and by which they believe themselves so warmly affected is most frequently nothing more than an effect either of a desire of perpetuating their names or pride of command do you not know that galileo was unworthily dragged to the prison of the inquisition for having maintained that the sun is placed in the centre and does not move around the earth that his system first offended the weak and appeared directly contrary to that text of scripture sun stand thou still however able divines have since made galileo's principles agree with those of religion who has told you that a divine more happy or more enlightened than you will not remove the contradiction which you think you perceive between your religion and the opinion you resolve to condemn who forces you by a precipitate censure to expose if not religion at least its ministers to the hatred excited by persecution why always borrowing the assistance of force and terror would you impose silence on men of genius and deprive mankind of the useful knowledge they are capable of dispensing you obey you say the dictates of religion but it commands you to distrust yourselves and to love your neighbor if you do not act in conformity to these principles you are then not actuated by the spirit of god but you say by whom then are we inspired by laziness and pride it is laziness the enemy of thought which makes you averse to those opinions which you cannot without study and some fatigue of attention unite with the principles received in the schools but which being proved to be philosophically true cannot be theologically false it is pride which is ordinarily carried to a greater height in the bigot than in any other person which makes him detest in the man of genius the benefactor of the human race and which exasperates him against the truths discovered by humility it is then this laziness and this pride which disguising themselves under the appearance of zeal render them the persecutors of men of learning and which in italy spain and portugal have forged chains built gibbets and held the torch to the piles of the inquisition thus the same pride which is so formidable in the devout fanatic and which in all religions makes him persecute in the name of the most high the men of genius sometimes arms against them the men in power after the examples of those pharisees who treated as criminals the persons who did not adopt all their decisions how many viziers treat as enemies to the nation those who do not blindly approve their conduct end of chapter twelve recorded by ted lorm in fort mill south carolina